Hey, hey, everyone, it's your Peacekeeper, and I'm coming at you with a premium ship review. This is the Tier 7 Indianapolis, and this was supposed to be the video for last week, but uh, things got a little delayed with other news. Anyway, we're going to dive right on into this because we've got a lot to cover, so I'm going to try and cover it as quickly as possible. The Indianapolis was the second of two ships in the Portland class of heavy cruisers, and she was built in 1929. The Portland class was the third class of treaty cruisers constructed by the U.S. Navy following the Washington Naval Treaty of 1922, first being Pensacola, followed by the Northamptons, then the Portlands. The Portlands were originally classified as light cruisers due to the thin armor, but were reclassified as heavy cruisers because of the 8-inch gun mounts in accordance with the London Naval Treaty. The original design for the Portlands consisted of just 1 inches of deck armor and upper hull construction with a 5-inch belt near the magazines and a 3 and a quarter inch belt over machinery spaces. In terms of service history, Indianapolis was at Johnston Atoll during the Pearl Harbor attacks and, upon hearing the news, joined the search for the Japanese carriers responsible for carrying out the attack. Upon returning to Pearl Harbor on December 13th after failing to locate those carriers, she linked up with the carrier Lexington and steamed for Rabul, New Britain, as part of Task Force 11. While on the way, they were attacked by Japanese aircraft, but were able to shoot down all of the aircraft before damage could be done. Task Force 11 would then link up with the Yorktown and Yorktown's battle group to attack targets in New Guinea. Task Force 11, after leaving New Guinea, would go to the Aleutian Islands there and supported U.S. troops in the Battle of the Aleutian Islands and attacked Kiska Island, where the Japanese military was staging for further attacks on the Alaskan Aleutian Islands. During the battle, Indianapolis and the task force sank several Japanese transports and submarines, while also destroying the Japanese shore batteries there. In 1943, she remained in the Aleutian Islands and participated in commerce raiding operations to starve off the forces at Kiska and Attu Islands. At the end of 1943, she was sent to Hawaii as the flagship of Vice Admiral Spruance in command of the 5th Fleet and sailed as the flagship of the 5th Fleet during the invasion of the Gilbert Islands, Tarawa Atoll, Macon, and after successfully fighting there, at the mar she went on to the Marshall Islands to reclaim them as well. In 1944, Indianapolis bombarded Japanese troop emplacements in Kwajalein Atoll to support Marines landing there. Once Kwajalein was captured, Indianapolis sailed on to the Western Carolines and then the Palau Islands, where the 5th Fleet sank three destroyers, 17 freighters, five oilers, and damaged 17 other Japanese ships there. Indianapolis went on to support landing operations at Saipan in the Battle of Philippine Sea, where she shot down a torpedo bomber on its attack run in the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. In 1945, she joined up with Vice Admiral Mitcher's Fast Carrier Task Force and escorted those carriers while they launched attacks on the Japanese mainland. She then went on to support forces landing at Iwo Jima. On 16 July 1945, Indianapolis sailed on her most famous and final mission. After successful completion of the Trinity nuclear bomb test, Indianapolis set sail from San Francisco to Tinian Island, carrying the enriched uranium core and other parts for the nuclear bomb that would eventually be dropped on Hiroshima, that being Little Boy. Sailing at 29 knots over the next 74 and a half hours, Indianapolis would set a speed record uh, to get from San Francisco to Pearl Harbor, which is unchallenged to this day. Upon completion of this mission, while returning to Guam, the Japanese submarine I-58 landed two Type 95 torpedoes into the starboard side of Indianapolis, causing Indianapolis to capsize and sink bow first in just 12 minutes. The attack killed approximately 300 members of the crew immediately. Over the next three and a half days, the survivors floated in the Pacific Ocean until they were finally spotted by a PV-1 Ventura on a routine air patrol in the area. Only 317 sailors survived the entire ordeal, and as a result, the captain, Charles B. McVeigh III, was court-martialed for, quote, hazarding his ship by failing to zigzag. In 1949, Fleet Admiral Nimitz remitted McVeigh's sentence and restored him to active duty, but McVeigh would retire shortly thereafter. McVeigh would eventually commit suicide in 1968 due to the guilt over the loss of Indianapolis and the constant harassing letters from the families of the crews that died. 
In 1996, a sixth grader by the name of Hunter Scott was able to convince the U.S. congressional uh, people to lead an investigation, which ultimately led to a resolution that led to the exoneration of McVeigh for the loss of Indianapolis. In 2001, the U.S. Secretary of the Navy formally purged his record of any wrongdoing in the loss. Also, if you haven't heard the news, Indianapolis was actually just discovered in August of this year in the Philippine Sea at a depth of just 18,000 feet. Overall, her entire service record would, gar- would garner her 10 battle stars and makes her one of the most decorated cruisers of World War II for the U.S. Navy. In terms of her in-game play style, Indianapolis plays very similar to the way Pensacola plays, with a couple of notable exceptions. She is at least somewhat more durable, owing to a much better armor layout and heavier armor overall. However, most like most U.S. cruisers in the game, her Citadel is large, above water, and overall her armor hull plating just doesn't stand up to withering fire from multiple targets. Indianapolis does gain the ability to use radar and is one of just a few ships in the game that has radar at Tier 7. And on top of that, it's not just any radar, it is the Des Moines radar with 9.9 kilometer range and 25 second active time. Indianapolis's anti-aircraft suite is also significantly better than Pensacola's is, and it actually makes her as an anti-aircraft cruiser somewhat more tolerable than Pensacola. Uh, But overall, the gunnery is pretty much identical to Pensacola, except, of course, Pensacola having 10 guns, Indianapolis only having 9. But Indianapolis gains significantly longer range than any other U.S. cruiser in the game gets by default. Overall, though, you know, Indianapolis is a little... It it can be a little frustrating to play. It just kind of depends on the map that you get and whether or not you get stuck in a Tier 5 to Tier 7 match or a Tier 7 to Tier 9 match. If you get stuck in the Tier 7 to Tier 9 match, it can be a little frustrating because a lot of those maps are very open, and this ship does not do well in open water. She is definitely best played hunting around in islands for ships, especially destroyers and cruisers that are dumb enough to expose anything resembling a broadside, because like all the other U.S. cruisers, she also gets those favorable 8-inch auto-bounce angles, which means that she can penetrate ships when they are presenting more of a nose-on profile to her. And that makes her very potent when played correctly. Much like Pensacola, though, she's going to rely almost entirely upon her stealth to get into those fights. So let's talk about some stats. She has 32,500 hit points, up to 146 millimeters of armor, and that is actually going to be over the magazine spaces, and only 100 millimeters over the armor belt. And I can't find any references to refits adding this, but I'm guessing Wargaming has a good reason for adding the extra armor plating. The main battery consists of three triple 8-inch guns. They are mounted 2 fore and 1 aft. The two in the front can fire straight ahead over each other, thanks to the second turret being uh, super firing over the first. They have a 16.9 kilometer main battery range, a 14.3 second reload time, a 26.9 second 180 degree turn time, a rather tight 150 meters worth of dispersion, and a 17% fire chance. The AP shell velocity matches that of both Miyoko and Pensacola at 853 meters per second. And of course, it's American armor piercing, so it's 4,600 damage. She does have a secondary battery that consists of eight single 5-inch 25 caliber Mark 19 Mod 6s. Uh, they also serve as part of the anti-aircraft suite. They're not as effective as the 38s, the um, 5-inch 38s that you see later on on U.S. cruisers and battleships and destroyers. But uh, they, they're plenty enough effective as any aircraft suite. But as a secondary battery suite, they're okay. 5.4 kilometer range. Four and a half second reload time, 11.5% fire chance, but that short range means you're basically playing at point blank range to use them. In terms of anti aircraft guns, she has eight dual 20 millimeter Orlikin guns, six quad 40 millimeter Bofors, and those eight single 120, uh, sorry, five inch 25 caliber guns. And that AA suite starts out at six kilometers and steps down to 5.1 with those Bofors and then 2.9 with the Orlikans. And there's enough AA here in addition to the defensive fire consumable 
that this ship has respectable AA for a Tier 7 cruiser. Maneuverability, this is another strong suit of hers. 32.5 knots, that's not the strong suit. 620 meter turning radius and 7.3 second rudder shift time, those definitely are the strong suits of this ship. Very maneuverable for a Tier 7 cruiser, and it's quite intoxicating, actually, using that 620-meter turning radius to just aggravate battleships to no end. Also, one of her strengths, her concealment, 10.8-kilometer detection range by sea and 7.1-kilometer detection range by air. Let's talk about some upgrades. In the first upgrade slot, we can go one of two different ways. Uh, I've got main armaments mod one selected here for the reduction in the chance of your main battery being incapacitated. That's 20% reduction. Also increasing its hit point pool by 50% and decreasing the time it takes to repair them by 20%. And the reason why I've chosen this on Indianapolis is because Indianapolis's main guns tend to get taken out rather easily. And that's uh, quite frustrating. And by taken out, what I, I don't mean like completely taken out and destroyed. What I mean is that the guns themselves get, you know, reset all the time, and that gets real old after a while. Auxiliary Armaments Mod 1 is the other one that I would uh, strongly consider, especially if you're planning on using the ship in the anti-aircraft cruiser role. Of course, if you're going to run a uh, Auxiliary Armaments Mod 1, you're probably going to want to pick up preventative maintenance on your captain. Thankfully, you can do that because this is a premium ship, which means you can run any captain you want. And in my case, I have Fleet Admiral Edward Reed, my 19-point Des Moines captain on board. In the second slot, I am running AA Guns Mod 2 because the accuracy of the ship is plenty good, so I don't see any need for Aiming Systems Mod 1. Of course, there are those that would, you know, will take that, and that's fine. Uh, AA Guns Mod 2 is going to push out your anti-aircraft max firing range an additional 20%. Aiming Systems Mod 1 is going to reduce the dispersion of your main battery by 7%, and it's going to add a little bit to your secondary battery firing range and decrease the dispersion of your secondaries, which really this is the, the secondary part isn't the reason why you take Aiming Systems Mod 1. These other two options, I would not expect the ship into secondaries to save its life, and I don't really think the turrets turn slow enough to justify Main Battery Mod 2. That's just my opinion. In the third slot, I'm running Propulsion Systems Mod 1 for the 20% reduction in the chance of your engine becoming incapacitated, as well as a 20% reduction in the time it takes to repair your engine. Uh, honorable mention to Steering Gears Mod 1. Either of those two options are, are good to go, in my opinion. Uh, if, if you're the person who can deal with losing your rudder, I would recommend taking Propulsion Systems Mod 1. I personally find that to be the better of the two choices for a cruiser. However, your mileage may vary. In the last slot, I am running Steering Gears Mod 2 to exploit that 620 meter turning radius and drop that rudder shift time down to 7.3 seconds. This is going to drop your rudder shift time in total 20%. Uh, honorable mention here to Propulsion Systems Mod 2, which is going to decrease the time it takes to reach full power by half, as well as increasing engine power when the ship starts moving. And that's going to be that negative 6 to plus 6 knot range. Uh, the difference between these two depends on your play style. If you are the type of person who can tolerate sitting and camping behind islands, Propulsion Systems Mod 2 is probably the better choice of the two. If you're someone like me who likes playing in open waters... A little bit more, uh, Steering Gears Mod 2 would be my recommendation. Also, let's talk about consumables because she does have a couple of different options. She does have hydroacoustic and defensive fire on one slot. Obviously, I'm running defensive fire. But more importantly is the surveillance radar option that takes over for your catapult fighter. And again, that's 9.9 .9 kilometer detection range for ships. It's active for 25 seconds. That's potent especially at Tier 7. If I remember correctly, it's the longest-ranged radar at Tier 7 by quite a healthy margin, which is the reason why I run it. So let's stop talking about this import. Let's go look at it in a battle. All right, so this battle is going to actually be one of those highly coveted Tier 5 to uh, Tier 7 matches. There are carriers on both teams, and there is a healthy amount of basically every ship in the game. 
course, you know, we've got that high risk with all those battleships there. I hope the destroyers do their job. The map is Two Brothers. This map has undergone a number of changes since it came in during, I think it was closed beta was the first time we saw it. It might have been before that. I want to say it came back in closed beta. Uh, map tactics on this, uh, it, it, it's really kind of the same no matter which way you go. Basically, it's going to require a combination of destroyer cooperation and laying smoke, battleship cooperation and pushing, and cruiser support and taking out destroyers uh, that come ahead of the enemy force. And if you can't do all of that, it doesn't matter which way you go. In terms of, like lemming trains or everybody going to one side generally speaking that only works if your battleships are all you know fast battleships like the Gneisenau or Scharnhorst if you happen to get into a higher tier match it's a little bit easier to push with uh, your team all going to one side my strong recommendation though is to split your forces as best you possibly can and push hard if you are on the side that it has the weaker opposition if you manage to get a bunch of lucky hits in and take a bunch of ships out early on in the game your side needs to push hard and fast to get around the the horn so to speak and get to either their cap or the capture point that is up by their spawn so that you can help your team out that is most likely fighting over your spawn that is by far the easiest and less stressful way to do this map. The other option is, is you, everybody goes the same direction. Like I said, if you go that way, you really need to push hard and fast. So let's talk about Indianapolis. You can see here, I'm kind of parking myself by this island. You know, my, my event, my initial thought on this battle was that we were going to do a little bit of island camping and see if we can't maximize the amount of damage that we can possibly do. We've got ourselves this big heavy island here. We've got ourselves a Kamikaze R piloted by one of those o overpowered gaming guys. So hopefully he should be able to scout ahead with little real issue and allow us to kind of work behind this island and take out as many ships as we can from range. Again, using our range to kind of... Um, well, be an advantage, especially since we got a lot of open waters here. It seems like our battleships are a little slow in the uptake getting here. Obviously, one of them's in New Mexico. He's right behind me, but the Ganai's now just now loaded into the game. And so we don't have anything up there to really tank. And as I said at the first part of this, Indianapolis does not. Like, there, there is no tanking for Indianapolis. Uh, <laughs> You don't even get to really speed camp or a speed tank or anything like that. You basically are a floating XP pinata, much in the same way that Pensacola is. That's not entirely true. I mean, there, there are definitely times at which you can do some tanking, but overwhelmingly, your strength is entirely in your ability to shoot from long ranges and remain relatively undetected. Now, you can see there we pop defensive fire to help our our carriers fighters out a little bit and uh, hopefully you know they decide to come around this side of the map especially since our other side seems to be pretty lightly uh, packed over there so there's their shiratsu and we are firing at this graf spee and we are missing and doing absolutely terrible so we are going to poke our heads out of this and we are going to try instead to go for this congo and Look at that shot dispersion. Again, this is with this is without the the aiming module. Like I just don't see the need for additional accuracy. So we're going to try and leapfrog up to this next island. Oop, Shiratsu torpedoes, they fade out. And look at who's shooting at me already. Congo is and misses, but hey, we started him on fire and that is one of the strong suits of the ship. We do have the ability to start fires pretty regularly. Of course, the downside to this ship is much like all the Japanese cruisers. Unfortunately, uh, shooting over islands is much more difficult due to the flatter shell trajectories. This isn't a Cleveland. This isn't a, a fully upgraded Baltimore or Des Moines. Uh, there is a risk involved in using, you know, islands for gun cover in this manner. Usually what you'll see people do is you'll see them camp with just their nose poking out in the front two guns. This tends to minimize the uh, number of 
possible citadels that you can receive from enemies coming in, uh, but uh, ultimately it doesn't truthfully matter. So we've managed to got the, get this Congo on fire at least once. I'd like to get him on fire at least one more time, so we're fire off another salvo here and we'll probably find some other target to play against. Mostly because, well, we missed entirely with that, so that makes me curious to know what's actually going on. So we've got Shiratsuyu here. Probably wishing she was actually Yudachi, but, uh, well, it is what it is. Not had the opportunity to really use our radar so far. Our Geniza now is turning into Shiratsuyu's torpedoes. That's going to hurt. Eh, he manages to survive that actually pretty well. Being maneuverable is an advantage, I guess. And we are taking fire from a Fiji. Well, let's see if we can't help take out this Graf Spee. Want to make sure that we avoid them torpedoes, too. Whoa! Lots of incoming fire, and this is what I was talking about. So you can see our team is over on the east side, is pushing hard and fast to their flank. And if you can get enough heavy hitters, like for instance the Bayern over there is really not in a place where I'd like to see him. I'd like to see him a little bit closer to their cap. If you can get more people concentrated over there, it actually ends up being a massive advantage for your team because now they are fighting a two-front war. It's harder for them to angle their cruisers. It's harder for them to angle their battleships. And quite frankly, we're not really we're not really putting up much of a fight on this side. They're just not pushing. In fact, uh, you know, we got a New Mexico that's sitting in the back that's camping a little bit. Probably not the best place for him to be. Eh. It is what it is. So we got ourselves a cruiser here, and if there's one thing that U.S. cruisers excel at, it is in the cruiser hunting role. And that looks like a pretty good grouping, except he turns, but we managed to get the Citadel anyway for about 8,000 damage. And that is that American piercing ammo, and he is turning broadside again. And this ship is just the Punisher of Broadsides. If you can catch him broadside, you can do quite a lot of damage. That salvo, we didn't get any hits. I'm presuming because he slowed down. And now we have a choice that we need to make. Our options are we can either push, can retreat, maybe get some lucky citadels off on this uh, Graf Spee here. Maybe use this island to, you know, a, a do a little bit better of an attack. But we're going to pop our radar and see if we can't find ourselves... A destroyer. Well, look at what we found. We found ourselves a destroyer. We had AP loaded. We shot it anyway. And now we've got our Atlanta engaged. He knows that the destroyer is there. He knows that the destroyer is within his range. So he should pop his radar as soon as mine goes down. And, okay, mine goes down, but the Shiratsuyu is still spotted. And look at that Atlanta presenting that nice broadside profile. Okay, so... Down goes, there's the Shiratsuyu, he burned his radar, and nothing. Now we need that Atlanta to pop back up. That would be super nice. You can see here I'm kind of retreating at this point because our flank is falling apart. We just lost a battleship. We're going to lose another. Ooh, we got five HE hits on that uh, Atlanta in the smoke. It'd be nice if we had a little bit better radar, but we don't, unfortunately. So turning here, trying to... Uh, I don't want to expose this broadside, but I'm kind of out of choices. We're going to end up beaching ourselves here, trying to shoot at this Graf Spee and continue to support our guys over here for as long as possible. But we are we are basically in the process of bailing out of this side. You know, we're kind of falling apart over here. We've only managed to kill one ship. That was the Atlanta and I that killed it. Ah, there's the second one. So we finally managed to kill a second one, and down goes yet another of ours. Our Gremiashi gets detonated by the Omaha. Things aren't looking so hot. We got ourselves an Arizona pushing in hard and heavy, and we don't have any real effective way of taking out an Arizona. I'm hoping the Atlanta... Well, he's... He's doing the smart thing, too. We're, we're getting the heck out of Dodge. Our New Mexico is up there. I... Don't know why... Uh, he's going to end up getting abandoned because there's very little that we can actually do to, to support him. I mean, he's all the way over there. He goes 21 knots. Not the best tactical positioning in the world. Fiji, unfortunately, behind the island there. And down goes yet another of our ships, and things are looking even worse. Trying to make the best of this situation, not really happening. 
and we are about to be detected by this Arizona, so we might as well begin our engagement. That's going to expose us to the hood, so we need to be cognizant of his incoming fire. Hoping to get behind this island before I take any of his fire. Not that it would really shield me from his, uh, from being spotted. I was hoping, there it goes. Okay, so we, we stop being spotted. We can kind of use this island a little bit for some cover, at least temporarily, but, you know, we don't have enough bow armor to actually withstand incoming fire from battleships, so that's something to be aware of. 15-inch shells from Hood, 14-inch shells from Arizona, those will all do some serious damage. And, of course, Hood is looking at me. I'm sitting here thinking to myself, well, you know, we wait just a little bit, back up just a little bit. Maybe we can get him distracted by something else. Turn, we want to turn ourselves to be a little bit more nose in, especially since he's lost interest in us. And just continue to take off, you know, 2,500 hit points at a time. Hoping that our kamikaze lands some good torpedo hits on the hood. We need to take out ships. We did manage to sink a third ship finally, but we are down significantly. And hello, random citadel. I bet if I was in the Bismarck, that would have been a detonation on behalf of the hood. Odd citadel found it with US 8 inch AP. Curious. Wargaming, what did you do to the hood? Did you put in its realistic uh, weak spot? Anyway, you can see we're, we're doing some pretty hardcore island camping at this point in time, but we really need to make up our mind about what we're going to do. The, this battle is not flowing in our favor. The New Mexico has finally managed to catch up. I've been a sufficient distraction here for plenty long, but we are still sailing full reverse. And unfortunately, we are spotted by aircraft, which is only exacerbating the problem of potentially being fire. Well, our AA is at least getting into this fight again. 4,600 damage with six HE shell hits on that hood. Was hoping for a fire. That would be nice. Bait out the damage control party. Got ourselves an Arizona that's back up over here. And now they are actually smoking the hood. Really should try to get AP another Citadel on him. We are up to 54,124 damage. However, uh, battle on the entire eastern flank has completely disintegrated. We have an Atlanta that is trying to catch an Omaha in the mid. We've got ourselves a Arizona T-22, a hood that Arizona just fired. That should be a, a hint here. We've managed to go so far pretty long without actually being detected. And or shot at, I guess I should clarify. And oh, okay, so we are detected. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that's the T22 again. And so we have ourselves in Arizona that we need to deal with. We need to help our New Mexico as best as we possibly can. But more importantly, we need to get the heck out of Dodge. At this point, it, there's really no point in hanging out. And there's the shells from the hood. Oh, oi, oi, whoo. Lucky Indianapolis here. Whew. And our Atlanta managed to smoke the to smoke that Omaha that came through. Good on him. And come on, give me some fires. <laughs> now we're going to use our speed maneuverability to get the heck out of Dodge as best we can. While we're firing, we're cycling back and forth on our um, on our rudder to get the front guns to bear while simultaneously doing our best to avoid incoming fire you can see not working out terribly well here but uh well i mean doing damage wise getting nor getting those pen hits and Whew. we managed to make it we managed to get ourselves a fire and we are up to 60,179 damage and this arizona burned his damage control party now the now the impetus is on us to get that second fire and cause him to burn we have only managed to kill four. Oh, he's flooding now. Now, if we could get a if we could get a fire on top of that flood, that would just be huge. Come on, Indianapolis, give me some good fire chance. Look at that shell dispersion! Holy buckets! And there's our fire. Great. So we did two thousand damage. And we got ourselves a fire. He's flooding. He's got the fire. If we can continue to light him up, maybe we can get another fire and we can exploit that. They've got an Atlanta over there as well. We're going to... Well, we got a couple of different options of what we can do. Uh, managing to take fire. Oh, what's this? Did somebody 
Yes, yes they did. Well, hello there, Fiji. And you're broadside, and I am radaring you. Guess what that means? You're in for a world of hurt. Unfortunately, he is also hurting me a lot. Come on, shoot the guns. There we go. Yes, down he goes. <laughs> uh, talk about stress. Now we got this Byron that's coming through. We're up to 87,000 damage. We managed to completely decimate that Fiji. Unfortunately, we got so much hole and superstructure there that we just took a lot of his AP damage, that six inch AP. But, uh, you know, overall, you can kind of see how Indianapolis's play style mirrors that of Pensacola. Basically, you're running hit and run attacks, you're camping islands, you're doing your best to maximize your advantages, which is mostly in the close quarter stuff, but not entirely. Got a couple of different options and ways to pursue things, but at the end of the day, you know, you're you're kind of stuck in the same faults that Pensacola has. You don't have a lot of armor. You what armor you do have is really not good at blocking anything larger than say destroyer cal destroyer caliber AP. I about to say destroyer -ber. <laughs> Uh, apparently I'm a little tired this morning. Uh, so th there's a couple of different options there and well, we're going to take the better option here. You know, knowing when to retreat is always a good thing. We can delay the inevitable here. We've got 44 seconds until our radar comes up, but we do have a Byron that is coming through the channel here. I'm hoping that the Atlanta might pop his radar. Or that, okay, so he's spotted by something. I don't know if it's the New Mexico or what, but we're going to slow down a little bit here. We're going to see if we can't maybe get him on fire, do anything to help our team out as best we possibly can. I mean, we're, we're trying to maximize our, our winning potential here, but we only have three minutes and 40 seconds to go in the match. That is definitely going to make things tight. So we are now backing up. I don't recommend backing up for this long. I should have gone stationary. We're waiting for him to come around the corner here, see if we can't fire at him, maybe even without being detected, which it looks like, ah, aircraft is spotting. But we, hey, we did 3,000 damage and we picked up his secondaries. Now we need to get the heck out of Dodge because we will lose the fight with his secondaries. He is turning into us, aiming a little low there, but again, 924 hit points. Uh, not a huge thing. Our secondaries are going to town on him. We're returning the favor. Look at that. We even got a secondary hit. I don't know it did any damage, but it was there. And we're kind of playing this game where we're like, oh, hey, we should probably be leaving. <laughs> we only have 3,000 some odd hit points. We should... Oh, Farragut. Can I get the kill before the Farragut goes down? Ugh, nope. Nope, nope, and island. Well, we need to get out of here because this Byron is definitely pressing hard and heavy towards us. Um, you know, they're probably going to win this battle anyway. If I can prolong it at all, that would be fantastic. Our Indianapolis is doing I don't know what. <laughs> Just odd. I, he's probably out of aircraft. That doesn't help the situation any. Apparently, I can't hit this Indianapolis or this uh, Byron at all. Okay, so we're going to turn in just a little bit, get all of our guns to bear. Come on, give me fire or something. The island is conveniently or inconveniently blocking things. And now I'm starting to think, well, I'm the focus of his attention, so this is going to get real ugly real fast. He is coming around the mountain. There she comes. And, oh, fire. Okay, can we duck around the side of this island before he gets a chance to shoot at us? We're going to try, that's for sure. We're up to 92,644 damage. He is on fire. Managed to shoot down some aircraft. He's on fire again. So now he has two fires. One minute and 35 seconds to go. Defensive fire consumables, unfortunately, down. Hit an island there. Need to make it through these twin... Oh, he missed with those bombers. So it's up. Okay, so the Byron is repaired now. He's traversing those guns. Come on, my guns. Get in here. Oh, this is a fatal mistake. Fatal mistake. There's Confederate, and we managed to get undetected somehow. Just in time. Holy buckets. Just in time. And just when you think things are, are starting to look real bad, we've got ourselves in Atlanta over here. Unfortunately, 
we just are not going to be able to cap fast enough. Maybe we can get the kill on this independence and get ourselves, you know, enough points to uh, get ahead. Well, it's not going to happen. We're going to have to cap them out and we're going to have to win it. And, and I, I just don't know that it's going to happen. If all they have to do is get one reset and that would be the end of us. Okay, we got ourselves a fire on the Indy, 98,500 damage. Switch to AP there. For those that are wondering, AP on broadside carriers is absolutely destructive and can yield multiple Citadel hits. There's one of them, 7,000 damage, up to 105,563 damage, 14 seconds to go. The carrier's on fire. Down he goes. Oh, we got a Farragut around the corner here. Six seconds to go. Unfortunately, they've reset the cap, so even if even if we had enough time, we probably wouldn't survive long enough, and the game ends. Indianapolis is overall a pretty fun ship to play. I, my only frustration with her is that, you know, like all the other U.S. cruisers, she's very dependent on terrain on the map. 105,563 damage, two kills, Confederates. And team score wise, two, 1,216 base XP that would have put us on fourth on their team. 605,000 potential damage, but a lot of damage done to fires and from Citadel hits. Very much like other U.S. cruisers, you got to play them to their strengths. Those close range engagements against other cruisers are absolutely devastating with that AP. Anyway, I'm your peacekeeper. Like, comment, subscribe, and thank you for watching.